gang. We've got a Telecaster to work on. This is an unusual color, isn't it? It's kind of a navy dark purple with a candy effect. It's got some metal flake in it. I like it. I wonder what will happen over time. It depends on what kind of clear coat was used. Nitrocellulose lacquers and some of the polyvinyls, they tend to yellow considerably. And usually it'll turn something like this into a deep forest green or a kind of viridian turquoise color. And blue pigment is often also quite fugitive. It, it'll fade out with UV exposure. The owner should take a picture now while it's fresh for comparison in 30 years. Be fun. It's got a perloid pick guard, sometimes affectionately called mother of toilet seat. Yes, there are people who watch these videos who aren't guitarists and they're not up in all of the terminology, but that is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's called that affectionately. And they did actually make toilet seat covers wrapped in this kind of material back in the 50s. It's a neat effect. You can see that it's formed from translucent squares of plastic that were piled together in a big box and re-amalgamated with solvent and lots of pressure so they fuse but they don't completely melt. So you get this interesting ice cube effect. Love it. The player has recently put on a new neck. This seems to be Mexican made from 2021, so it's still fresh. A lot of people are going for this lightly toasted or torrified maple these days. Torification is a process where the wood is cooked and dried under pressure at very specific temperatures in a process designed to replicate the effects of age on wood fiber. So it removes not only the free water molecules that are in wood when you harvest it, they sit in the empty cellular spaces in the wood, but it also takes away the bound water in the cell walls, which usually takes much longer to release. Um, ostensibly this hardens the resins and the other chemical components in the cellular structure of the wood. Uh, it happens naturally over time, this speeds it up. People ask what I think about torrefied wood. I've worked with it a little bit. It seems to be lighter, generally speaking. Um, if it's maple, it sometimes smells like pancakes when you cut into it, which is nice. Carving it, though, it feels a bit more brittle to me. It's not as pleasant to carve into as regular air-dried wood. As for the sound, does it sound better? Who's to say? I'll say it sounds different. How's that? The player was doing some work on the nut, and he fears it got a little bit away from him. Uh, looking at it, I can see that the distance between the D and the G strings seems to be a little bit far apart compared to some of the others. If we're lucky and he didn't file too deeply, we might be able to salvage this, actually. If not, we'll make a new one. We'll also do our best to intonate it. We'll check out the frets, set it up, and make it as easy to play as we can. The first thing I want to do is get an overview of what the action and the relief is like. If that's close to normal, then I know what I have to work with in terms of the nut height. So we've got just around 4 64ths on the bass side, which is good. And on the treble, slightly too high. It's around 5 64ths. The other thing I notice is that the action at the 12th fret seems to be slightly higher than what's going on up here, which is the opposite of what you'd expect. Yeah, it gets lower. That means that either the neck is straight and then kicks up at the end, possibly due to a shim in the neck pocket, or more likely there's probably a bit too much relief in the neck itself, which uh, is the next thing I'll check. So the relief, measured with a capo at the first fret and holding down the base E close to the body joint, measuring at the sixth, turns out to be around 14 or 15 thousandths, which is too much. Uh, I'd like about half that much. So I'm going to adjust that first. Mexican-made fenders take a 3 16 Allen wrench. I want to make sure it's good and seated in there. Actually, it feels loose, but that's because the nut itself is very loose. No tension on it at all. Okay, that's starting to engage. Let's see what it did. So we're down to around 12 thousandths. Still a ways to go. I have a couple more adjustments. I've got the relief sitting around six or seven thousandths, and the action has come down considerably on the bass side, 
way too low. And on the treble we're sitting just about right. So I'm going to do a quick little action adjustment on the saddles here and then I'll start working on the nut. So I've reset the saddle height to give the action that I want, which in this case is around 460 force on the base, slightly less on the treble. And in so doing, of course, I've noticed um, another issue is popping up in that these saddles are sitting quite tall, uh, such that the screws are just about at the same plane as the strings. You don't want them above. Slightly below is better. And so that means I can do one of two things. I can either lop a couple of threads off each of these, or I could um, lightly shim the neck pocket. Just for interest sake, just going to check these out. I expect they're probably sitting around half an inch, or maybe 12 and a half millimeters. Yeah. Ordinarily, you know, 11 is kind of where I expect to see them, 10 or 11. So these are a little bit high. Uh, I think shimming the neck pocket is probably going to be the best thing to do. So here's a test. How high above the first fret are these strings currently sitting? Using the press test, it feels like there's room to maneuver. Checking it out with the uh, feeler gauge, we're sitting around 22 thousandths on the bass side, and I think it's probably similar on the treble. Yeah, a little high. That's good. Oops, until we get to the one string that's kind of bothersome. Ooh, there might not be very much room to maneuver. Sometimes with judicious filing we might be able to get those slots back in order. This kind of wandering offline can be hard to avoid if you're not practiced at it, and especially if the nut starts off way too tall, because all that extra material you've got to plow through gives you the opportunity to pull to one side or the other. It's not hard, and you know, if you're off by three thousandths it starts to get obvious. <laughs> you know, in terms of string spacing there are two schools of thought. There are those who expect the distance from string to string center lines should be equal. And then there are others who want a graduation um, from treble to bass, where the, the thicker strings are farther apart. So the same distance would be measured from the outside of one string to the outside of the next. And that just naturally produces the widening effect. Both systems work. They feel slightly different. A lot of people can get used to either kind. So measuring the distance between the centers of the outside strings, if we divide that by 5, we'll get equal divisions. So let's check and see how that relates to reality. So we've got somewhere around 272 thousandths between the center lines. And this is difficult to measure by eye. but it seems like these started off with equal center lines. The high E might have pushed in slightly and yeah definitely the D string moved slightly to the bass side. We can talk about how far the strings should be from the edge of the fingerboard. On narrower necks usually there's less distance there so in cording your fingers aren't so cramped but there are practical limits, um, namely how much of an angle there is on the fret ends. Some makers use a really low angle, like 45 degrees, and drag that inwards quite a ways. And you have to allow for that, because you can't fret notes on the bevels. They'll just slide right off the fingerboard. You can see how buried these strings are in the nut surface there's extra material there that we can dress off the top. So when I want to move a string laterally in the nut, I don't try and muscle it sideways with the file held vertical, because that's only going to give us a slot that's too wide. Um, this D string is a 26 thousandths string. I'm using a 26 thousandths wide fret file. Um, so instead, I angle it in the direction I want to go. And then afterwards, when we're dressing off the excess, um, it gets rid of most of that angled appearance and just leaves us a slot that's half the diameter of the string or maybe a little bit more. I've only got a few thousands to play with here, so I've got to do it right the first time. And 
Now we need a little bit of a downward angle towards the tuners, but on a fender style nut there's not much we can do there. Otherwise we'll be cutting into the back edge of the uh, sort of buttressing material here. That sometimes happens. And in guitars that are older, where the frets have worn down, and so has the nut, oftentimes the strings themselves will cut grooves back here. We want to avoid that if we, uh, if we can. I managed to move the string over about three thousandths of an inch, which brought it to within a thin pencil line's width of perfection, better than most. And I also pushed the high E string into a nice location as well. One more thing. This guitar has Fender locking tuners on it. Uh, these are the ones that are stepped in height, so the ones farthest from the nut are lowest. These closer ones seem to be about standard height. And I think these were designed to appease tremolo junkies who want to dive bomb without going out of tune, using a standard Strat trem, you know, laboring under the assumption that a string tree, which is an integral part of Leo's original vision, adds friction which can hinder the optimal return to pitch when you release the bar. So I think the idea is that if you have a shorter tuner post you can do away with this thing altogether and not worry about it. The reality is without a string tree it doesn't really give you quite enough break angle. Um, especially if you're enamored with the idea that you should only need a single turn of string or less around the post. The idea being that multiple turns of string also store up friction and energy um, and thus also mess up the tuning if you use vibrato. In the original stringing scheme for the Fender guitars, they anticipated several turns. I think it was three on the bass, five on the treble. So pushing the takeoff point of the string lower for a good break angle, that's how they got away with not having an angled headstock. In this type of locking tuner, if you don't do multiple wraps, you've got the string coming off much higher. And I'm not sure if the camera mic is going to pick this up, but on the A string in particular, there is a little sympathetic buzz that happens when you pluck it. And initially you might hear it and think, oh, maybe the nut slot is too low. It's not. Maybe it was rattling on the first fret. It's actually the lack of break angle allowing the string to dance around on the bottom of the nut slot. Because if I push down a little bit, it goes away. So in this case, forget about any advantage from a locking tuner. It might look weird, but we might be better off swapping for one of the short ones up here because you know in this case we've got a functional string tree and the low height does nothing for us but we need extra oomph for the lower strings just eyeballing it you can see how much more break angle we have on those treble strings than on the bass so you know when I restring this I will likely put a couple extra turns on these lower strings um, the player is a technically minded person and um, he can swap them out himself, you know, if he wants to. The guitar's the color of Veruca Salt after she became a blueberry. You want to be fairly careful when pulling a neck like this out because you have that short section of body that's kind of unsupported on the treble side. So you want to keep the neck forward in the pocket so it doesn't act like a wedge. And just be careful when you're removing it. This was a tight fit. We can see the date. This is only seven months old. I have a piece of maple veneer that's about half a millimeter thick, uh, 22 thousandths, which I'll use to make the shim. In this case, where I need to lower the saddles, I need to taper it in the opposite direction than is typical for these things. Usually the neck pocket is too deep and we end up having to tip the end of the neck up so there's room to bring the action down. Here the thick part of the shim will be at the edge of the body. So I'll double stick tape it and then sand it. Um, got some pencil lines there so I can track my progress. 
the shim is long enough to end up somewhere around the second set of screw holes, that'll give me decent support. It's long enough to do the job. I'll color the edges so it won't be visually distracting because you will be able to see the shim at the end of the body. With the neck reinstalled, the action is now too high, which was the aim, so I'll lower the saddles. Well, I was tuning up and I just broke an E-string. And given the fact that this thing arrived without an E-string, suggests that this guitar might have a problem with breaking E-strings. Nothing worse than an electric guitar that breaks strings. So, I'm going to look at this tuner pretty carefully and see if there's a bit of a burr or something sharp there, which might be causing the issue. I'll lightly file the takeoff points with a rat-tailed file, and then sand with some 600 grit to smooth it out. This kind of thing is not uncommon, it just takes a little bit of work. Setting the intonation on an old school Telecaster. This is just like the originals, it's going to be a set of compromises. Because no, you won't get every string perfectly intonated, it's not a possibility. And that's an interesting point. You know, like, what is functional intonation? In other words, how good does it need to be to make music? And obviously that was a topic that Fender had to address pretty quickly, because within four years they came up with the fully intonatable Stratocaster bridge. And yet, they maintained the simple three-saddle telly into, gosh, I think it was like the mid-70s probably. And then only on certain models did they go to the six saddles. So most of the good Telecaster music you've heard was played on something without perfect intonation. A lot of flat-top acoustics don't fully intonate either. Neither do banjos. The most expensive arch tops in the world, played by very discerning jazz musicians who can both name and hear a flat 13th. A lot of them playing those big Italian jazz boxes, the D'Angelicos, the Benedettos, De Quistos, and so forth. Um, straight angled saddle, not even a compensated B-string. So there's a choice to make. Do you want to hear the outside E's beating in perfect unison when you're playing octaves? Or do you maybe want to hear a really sweet fifth? between the high E and the A string. Or maybe you want to find an average between the notes on each saddle. I don't think that's so great, but maybe you do. I mean, you've got to figure out what works best for your playing style. Um, I think about, like, Reverend Gary Davis. Every recording he ever made, I think his A string is purposely flat. It had to be. It was a musical choice he made, because he wanted... That's the way he wanted to hear it. He wanted that touch of dissonance, the kind of it's crunchy. It's in the cracks. So no matter which way I go, I always make sure the high E string intonates perfectly. That means the B is likely going to play a little bit sharp, because it's too short. Most of us who play acoustic guitars are used to that sound. It doesn't bother us that much. And on the middle saddle, I'm going to favor the G string. Now it might end up being a little bit flat and the D a little bit sharp, but the G is the one I'm going to go with. Um, and then I'm going to get the A right bang on, which means the low E is going to be a little bit sharp, which coincidentally also happens a lot of the time on flat top acoustics, again. But for whatever reason, our ear doesn't seem to mind it as much. And with that, I mean, you can play good old-fashioned rock and roll, or if you've got your fancy boots on, you can play both country and western. All right, I think we're set. Let's do a quick inventory. On the bass side tuners, I now have two wraps of string, which is just enough to get rid of that weird sympathetic buzz thing that was happening. The nuts now all cleaned up. Spacing has been adjusted. I got rid of some of the damage that was on the back side here from previous attempts. The neck is now much straighter. And we managed to get rid of that rising thing that was happening where the strings were closer to the frets at the end of the board than at the 12th fret with that reversed shim. That also helped lower the saddles just enough that they aren't protruding above the height of the strings. It's tuned up, it's intonated. I do like me a good Telecaster. <laughs>